All right, if you would go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. We're going to continue our series on the Gospel of John, chapters 10 through 15, as we answer the question that John asks, and that is, who is Jesus? Now, I told you that chapter 12 ended really the first half of the book, which is the focus on Jesus' public ministry and included seven miraculous signs. But in chapters 13 through 21, Jesus withdraws from the crowds and focuses primarily on his closest friends. And he no longer speaks to the crowds. And this, of course, includes the Holy Week, which begins today, right? Did you guys know that today is Palm Sunday? So this is the beginning of Holy Week that includes Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, which we're excited about next week. And this week takes up chapters 13 through 21 in the Gospel of John. So if you are able and willing, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word as we read this aloud. Click that up there so you can see the reference. There you go. Whoops. Can you go back one for me? Okay. There you go. Well, that's weird. Okay. Um, chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher... Have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit. Teach us, open our hearts and minds to understand the meaning of this story and the words of Jesus and what you're inviting us to do in response. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, this is one of the most famous stories in the New Testament. And it's, it's very interesting for several reasons. One... It's only found in the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, don't even mention this story, which could, of course, be one reason that John feels the need to share it. He also shares it at the table on the night Jesus was betrayed, and there's a story lacking at that table. The Lord's Supper occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's one of the ordinances of the church, along with baptism, but it's not found in John's gospel. And, and people debate as to why did John leave out the Lord's Supper? 
And we're not sure why. We don't know. But in all likelihood, John's gospel was the, the last of the, the four to be written. And his, is, his material is very different than the other three. And he probably wanted to share stories and teachings of Jesus that had not been shared in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So he probably saw no need to repeat this story because the story of the Lord's Supper was so well known by this time. But the story about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples had been left out. And so he emphasized this story. In the place of the Lord's Supper, the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, his 12 closest friends, the apostles. And this is an interesting thing because what Jesus does is something that a rabbi would never do. So you can write this down. When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he demonstrated his sacrificial love for us. Let me help you understand. Uh, Jesus is at the table. The food is already being served. But no one has come around and washed the feet of those sitting there. Now, when we say sitting, they were actually reclining. They were actually on the ground. And they probably had pillows. And the table was just a foot or so off the ground. And so they're all probably leaning on their left side with their feet going out from the table. And it's customary for someone to serve the group this way. Now, it's interesting. Jesus is the rabbi. He's the master here. Um, but even disciples of a rabbi weren't expected to wash his feet. This was such a menial task that it was even beneath students of a rabbi. In fact, Jewish men weren't supposed to wash anyone's feet. Even Jewish slaves were not supposed to wash feet. That was beneath even a Jewish slave. So you had to be a non-Jewish slave or a woman or a child to do such dirty work. Well, apparently none of those people were available. So everybody just started eating with dirty feet. So Jesus takes off his outer garments. He puts a towel around his waist. He prepares a pitcher, probably in a basin, fills it with water. They're all watching him do this. And then he goes around and he starts washing their feet, probably pouring a pitcher of water over it. He's washing their feet. And this is absurd that a rabbi would wash the feet of his pupils. This really is a picture of of three things. Jesus' humility, his love, and the cross. All three are wrapped up in this image. Um, Paul talks about this kind of sacrificial love in Philippians chapter 2 when he says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, a slave, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So in Philippians 2, Paul describes the humility of Jesus, that Jesus was willing to come to this earth and be a servant all the way to and including his death for us. So when he washed the feet of the disciples, this was symbolic of his love and humility that he would demonstrate fully in less than a week when he was nailed to the cross to suffer for the sins of all those who would come to know him later. So, The washing of the feet of the disciples is actually a picture of the cross. And how much love Jesus had for his own, and how much he was willing to humble himself and do the lowest task, which was ultimately his death on a cross for our sins. But he painted a picture of his death when he washed their feet. You know, the washing of feet is actually an ordinance in some church traditions. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there are some traditions like the Brethren Church and Free Will Baptist that actually include this as an ordinance. So, in addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper, they add foot washing as an ordinance. And every time they participate in the Lord's Supper, which we're going to do later today, every time they do that, they actually engage in foot washing. 
Usually men are separate than women, but they do this at the same time they take the Lord's Supper. Usually before the Lord's Supper, they do the washing of feet. And it's interesting, and you ask them why they do this. They say, well, right here Jesus said in verse 15, you should do as I have done for you. This is the same kind of language he uses for the Lord's Supper. They're like, well, if we're going to do what he did in the Lord's Supper, shouldn't we do this also? Which is pretty convicting. Now, the truth is, the church did not take this that way. They've known about this from the very beginning. They didn't take this that way in the beginning, and so this was not an ordinance for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I've done it, and it's a powerful symbol. It's a powerful symbol of love and humility. To be willing to do the dirtiest job that would normally be considered beneath not only a rabbi, but one of his pupils. Jesus does this task that only the lowest of lows in that culture should have done because he decided nothing was beneath him, which is why he was willing to die on the cross for our sins. So I want you to see the washing of the feet of his disciples as a picture of Jesus' unconditional, sacrificial love for us. He was willing to lower himself all the way to the point of dying on the cross in obedience to the Father that you and I could be made right with God. And the church, knowing this story for 2,000 years, has taken it in several different ways. And I want to share with you three ways I think that we should understand and apply this passage to our lives. And here's the first one. The first one is Jesus invites us to let him wash us. Listen to the words. Uh, when he came to Peter, uh, Peter, thank, thank God for Peter. Peter's just so bold. You know, he just says whatever he thinks. He, he's, he's probably the only one of the 12 that really just blurts out stupid stuff. And it's so good because half of what Jesus teaches the 12 is the response to something stupid Peter says. And if Peter hadn't said anything, I wonder if we would even know what Jesus was thinking about the matter. And so I'm really grateful for Peter for just saying what everyone else is thinking so Jesus could correct everyone. He sees Jesus doing this slave task that was beneath everyone in this room. And when Jesus came to him, he says, you going to wash my feet? Jesus says, you don't understand what I'm doing, but later you will. He's like, nope, nope, you're not going to wash my feet. Never. You know, he's so bold. You know, and Jesus probably just rolls his eyes. And then he says in the second part of verse 8, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, he wasn't talking about his dirty feet. He had dirty feet before and been a part of Jesus' movement. Jesus wasn't talking about washing feet anymore. When Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part of me, he was talking about the forgiveness of sins. Which Paul used that same language in the 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Listen to this. Paul writes, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then he lists some of them. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed. Same word. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, You were just like this. You were among those people. The list I just gave, I'm describing the church at Corinth. That's you. But something has changed you. You were washed, sanctified, justified in Jesus' name by the Holy Spirit. So, Paul explains what wash means. Wash means to be forgiven Through the death of Jesus. In other words, the forgiveness of sins is the result of Jesus' death. Now, this is pictured in one of the ordinances of the church, baptism. Sometimes people think baptism is magical. That if you get baptized, your sins are washed away. Well, baptism is not magical. It's just water. It may may take some dirt off of you, especially if you add soap. But 
it doesn't change you spiritually. It is, again, a picture. It's symbolic. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, the most important Sunday of the Christian calendar. And we're going to actually have a baptistry, like a little tub up here. And we're going to have a baptism. And at least three people said they want to get baptized. And a fourth person uh, is interested. And maybe more. And if you want to be one of those, if you want to make your profession of faith public, then I invite you to join us next Sunday. So, baptism is a picture of a bath. Of getting your sins washed away. Baptism doesn't wash your sins away. Your faith in the death of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness is what washes your sins away. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Baptism is just a picture of that. It's a picture that if we trust that Jesus died for us, we are forgiven and our sins are truly washed away for all time. God forgives us for all of our sins through the blood of Jesus. If by faith we trust in his blood, if we trust in his death on our account, then we're forgiven for everything we've ever done or everything we will do. We are washed. And unless we are washed, we have no part with Jesus. You see, Christianity is not a religion about ethics and morals. Some people try to reduce it to that, but it's not. Uh, I'm showing a picture here of a Baha'i temple. Any of you familiar with the Baha'i faith? You know, we used to have a next-door neighbor, Hope and I, who was a member of the Baha'i faith. And I learned a lot about Baha'i from her, from our next-door neighbor. And, you know, as, as a follower of Jesus, I respect people from every religion, including the Baha'i faith. And as religions go, you know, it's one of the better religions out there. But religions are all human attempts to repair our broken relationship with God. And every human attempt fails, even the part of Christianity that's a religion. One thing about the Baha'i faith that I thought was interesting and disturbing is this. The Baha'i faith says that all religions are ultimately the same in that they all teach us to be kind, to love one another, and to do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. They basically say, look, all religions teach us to be kind. And there's some truth to that. Most major religions actually do teach us to be kind. But they have reduced all religion, including the Christian faith, to ethics. And that's the problem that I have, is that Christianity cannot be reduced to ethics. Christianity is not primarily about keeping rules. It's primarily about being changed. Jesus said to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Christianity is not about keeping a bunch of rules. Christianity is about recognizing that you're a sinner who deserves to spend eternity separated from God, but by God's grace, he sent Jesus to die for you so that your sins can be washed away forever. And the Holy Spirit can come upon you and make you a new person. Baptism is a picture of dying, being buried, and being raised again to brand new life. Christianity is primarily about letting God change us. Because if he doesn't change us, we can't keep his rules anyway. God's rules are hard to keep. There are too many of them. Loving one another as much as we love ourselves. How do you do that? Well, you can't without God living inside of you. So apart from God washing us, apart from God sending his Holy Spirit to forgive us and empower us, we're hopeless to be better people. Christianity is not about trying harder. Christianity is about being changed from the inside out. That's what it's about. And baptism is just the first step of obedience to Jesus and a picture of what has already happened to us by faith. So the first application of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples is uh, we need to let Jesus wash us. If you have never asked Jesus to forgive you, why wait? It's Palm Sunday. Why don't you spend a little bit of time this morning while I'm talking ignoring me and praying and asking God to forgive you and to come into your life and change you? Because apart from being washed, We have no hope, and we have no part in Jesus or the kingdom of God. Well, the two other applications, we'll get to that after the break. We're going to take a three-minute intermission, and as soon as we're done, we'll come back and finish this up. Uh, Out these doors are the bathrooms, and then over here are some drinks, and we'll be back in three minutes. So when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he demonstrated his sacrificial love for you and me. And he invites us to do three things. And the first thing he invites us to do is to let Jesus wash us through forgiveness of our our sins because of his death on the cross so that we can be made right with God and so that God can begin changing us from the inside out. Now the second one is a result of the same conversation with Peter and that's this. 
Jesus invites us to keep short accounts with God. Um, It's interesting the way Jesus responds to Peter. Peter says, uh, Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then in verse 9, Simon Peter replies, then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. Well, if I have to be washed, then go ahead and give me a bath. Which is so weird. Uh, You know, the others are probably rolling their eyes like, leave it to Peter to make it weird. And Jesus responds this way. A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. Jesus is clearly not talking about the foot washing that is going on right now. Because he says, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Well, he didn't wash them physically. He washes them spiritually through his death to come. So what does Jesus mean when he says, once you've had a bath, you only need your feet washed? Well, the picture is that when we trust that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, when we come to trust, and that's not a one-time thing, it's you know, every day for the rest of our lives. We, faith is really a verb in the New Testament, so you don't just faith once, you faith every day, you get up and you faith. You get up and you trust that Jesus died for you. When you come to trust that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you're forgiven for everything you've ever done or will do. You can't even confess all of your sins to God because there are too many of them. You just confess that you're a sinner. And through, and, and through faith in, in the death of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, God forgives you. God forgives you for stuff you haven't even thought of yet. That's grace. But what do we do about sins we commit after we come to faith? There's so many wrong beliefs about this. Some people are like, well, you know, there's, there's, there's sins that send you to hell and there's, there's sins that don't. And, you know, the sins that send you to hell, you need to wait and get baptized and, and wash those away. And then the others, you know, there's another way to get rid of that. That's all bogus. It's not in the Bible. The truth of the matter is, any sin will keep us out of the kingdom. But because of his death on the cross, Jesus forgives us for all sins, past and future. But the truth is, we still sin. We still mess up. Well, John, many believe, wrote not just the Gospel of John, but 1 John, the letter known as 1 John, well, and 2 and 3 John. So if you go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, you'll find these words. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is how the church has come to understand this passage and the washing of feet, is that we believe that when we trust that Jesus has died for us, we're forgiven for all time, but we still mess up. And we still have to confess those sins. When I first became a Christian, I had to confess to God that I am a sinner. There are too many sins to even begin to name. But after I became a follower of Jesus, God invites me to keep short accounts with him, and that is to confess each sin as it happens. Is that so I can be forgiven? No, I'm already forgiven. That's to repair the broken relationship. So as a follower of Jesus, I have been forgiven once and for all, for all time, by my faith in Jesus. That's why baptism is a one-time event. And though you can get baptized a second time, especially if you don't think the first one was as meaningful, baptism is meant to be a one-time thing, meaning you're baptized as a picture that by faith you trust in Jesus and you're forgiven of all your sins. We don't get baptized every year. You know, growing up, you know, in a youth group in a church, there were people like this, right, that they would uh, pray to receive Christ like every Sunday. And then they would uh, get baptized over and over and over again. You know, they would keep like doing it all over again. And this is a misunderstanding. If by faith you trust that Jesus has died for you and forgiven you, you don't have to repeat that procedure. Even if you sin, you're forgiven. But you have to deal with the individual sins as they happen. You have to confess those to God and ask for forgiveness, not because you're not forgiven, but because the, the relationship needs to be restored. Look at it this way. I'm already forgiven by God for everything I, I will ever do in my life. But as I clutter up my life and get my feet dirty, right? So I'm clean. I've had a bath. As I go and get my feet dirty, and all of us sin on a regular basis, as a follower of Jesus, I still sin. As I sin, I deal with each one individually, one at a time, in order to repair the broken relationship. We talk about this on the Alpha Retreat, that the key to the spirit-controlled life is keeping short accounts with God. The mark of maturity in a believer is not how seldom we sin, but how quickly we deal with it. So what we want to do is we want to make the gap between my sin and my confession as short as possible. So when I blow it, it's like I've clogged up the pipe. 
Every time I sin, I'm already forgiven for this sin. I'm not going to ever pay for it. Jesus already paid for it because I'm a follower of Jesus. But every time I sin, I clog up the pipe. And my relationship with God is not authentic. It's not vulnerable because I have sinned or I plotted some sin and I've clogged up the pipe. But I want my relationship with God to be pure. I want God to hear my prayers. I I want to have an ongoing friendship with God. In order to nurture a friendship with God, I have to deal with every single individual sin since becoming a Christian as soon as it happens. To remove the clog. To restore the open pipe. In order to restore the friendship. Because whenever I hurt God's feelings, I deal with it. When I got married to my wife, I only had to say I do one time. I don't have to say that every month. I I said I do, but I still mess up and I still have to say I'm sorry in order to restore and repair the relationship. I'm already forgiven for everything I've done and will do. And I could spend the rest of my life never confessing sin, but I will have a terrible friendship with God. On the other hand, I prefer to get up every morning and spend time listening to Jesus in Scripture and praying to him every day and nurturing a friendship with him. And that means that throughout the day when I blow it, I bow my head and say, God, I messed up. Every time I kick the cat or whatever I do, I stop and say, that was not okay. That kind of confession keeps the pipeline clean and it keeps the relationship with God dynamic and powerful. That is the key to the spirit-controlled life is that we deal with sins as they happen as soon as possible. So... In the foot washing, we learn that we need a bath. We, we need to let Jesus forgive us for our sins and change us. We also learn from Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Once we've had a bath, we still need to regularly have our feet washed. And the third thing we learn, oh, before we go any further, let's just do that. Let's actually participate in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. I'm not finished with the message yet, but we're going to stop and do this right here in the middle. So one of the things that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians is before we take communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, we're to pause and to investigate our heart and make sure we're coming before God pure. So this is a perfect time for you and I to keep short accounts. So right now, I'm going to give you just a moment of silence, and I'm going to ask you to practice what I just said and to spend a few moments in private prayer and confession and ask Jesus to reveal anything that's keeping the two of you from a perfect relationship. And it will, of course, be on your end, not his. And then confess that and prepare yourself to participate in communion. And I'm going to ask for every baptized believer to participate in communion. And if you're not yet a baptized believer, but you are a believer, um, we can remedy that next week. And if you're not yet a believer, come and talk to me, and I'll tell you how to cross that line and experience God's forgiveness. So spend a moment preparing your heart for communion, and then we'll do that together. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I want to invite you right now to pass around the bread and the cup to each person around your table or in your row. And prepare to receive the elements with me. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of him.
if you would take the cup. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, which is poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. Drink this also in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you that the body of Jesus was torn by nails and that he spilled his blood on the cross so that if we consume his death by faith, we too are forgiven. Our sins are washed away. And everything we've ever done to break your heart, everything we will ever do to break your heart, You remove those sins as far as from the east from the west simply because we trust in the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Father, empower us to live from this moment forward the way you invite us to live through your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus invites us to be washed to keep short accounts. And finally, Jesus invites us to put the needs of others above ourselves. This is what the foot washing demonstrates, is that Jesus is willing to do the dirtiest job, which will ultimately include dying on the cross for our sins, to experience the wrath of God for our sins so that we could be forgiven. Jesus, by his death and by washing the feet of his disciples, is teaching them and us to put the needs of other people in front of ourselves. Jesus says in verse 12, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. One of our core values at Oasis is leadership development. Because we believe that God has called all of us to be leaders, and the way you lead is by putting the needs of others before yourself. The way you serve others is to lead, and the way you lead is to serve. God calls us into leadership, which is service. Our home church leaders put the needs of the group ahead of themselves. Our directors put the needs of our congregation ahead of themselves. Our staff are just chief servants at Oasis who lead by laying down their lives. And this is Jesus. Mark 10, 45 Jesus says, for even the Son of Man, God in human flesh, did not come to be served. And if anyone had a right, it was him. But to serve. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are to follow the example of Jesus who was willing to do the most menial job, the dirtiest job, because nothing was beneath the Son of God. Folks, if nothing is beneath the Son of God, then there is nothing beneath you. There's nothing beneath me. We are to put the needs of others ahead of ourselves. It doesn't matter who should do it. It doesn't matter who is assigned to do it. The question is, will you do it? Will you do it? This is a friend of mine from college, Dean Smedley. More recent picture of him. Um, Dean and I got to know each other pretty well in the summer of 1990. Uh, Both of us were involved in the same campus ministry, campus outreach. We were both from Sanford University. I I think he might have been a year behind me in school. Um, but Dean and I were part of the same group of 15, 16 uh, men and women, young people, college students, who went to Japan in 1990 for eight weeks and spent time sharing our faith on the campuses of Waseda University and Sophia University. And so we got to know each other pretty well, and we lived in the same house. We, we, we went to Takadana Baba Biblical Church in that part of Tokyo, and the, the church owned the three-story house, and on the bottom story, they had a permanent resident. And then on the second floor, they made that available for us, except it was for Sunday school on Sunday, so we had to like keep everything cleaned up. And then on the top floor, that's where the women stayed. Well, every once in a while, while we were all together in the house, um, the power uh, would go off. We w- would trip the circuit breaker, probably because the girls are you know, using their blow dryers or something, who knows. But th- the lights would just go out, the power would just go out, and we'd all be in the dark, and we would just stand there. Now, we knew that the circuit breaker was outside down one story and it was it took about 30 seconds to get there flip it and come back like 30 seconds but whenever the power would go off we just kind of stand there 
We figured if we wait long enough, someone else will do it. And it was always Dean. Dean would just bolt down, like try at the beginning. At the beginning of the summer, I think he was trying to beat everybody else. He would bolt down there and flip it and come back. And we were like, you know, whoo. And then after a while, it was just like, where's Dean? And why is he taking so long? I remember one time we were all standing in the dark. All the guys were just in there. We'd talk to each other. The power went off. We just went like this. And Dean was right in the middle of us. And he goes, good grief. And then he ran again. He was, at that point, I think, sick and tired of being the chief servant. But he still did it. And he never asked anybody else to do it. He just did it. All summer long, he went down before anybody else, even when that took a while, and put the power back on, right, with just flipping a switch. And I often think about that decades later, how quickly Dean Smedley ran to the first floor to flip the switch when the rest of us were happy to wait until he did it. And I think about how often in my life today I wait around and wonder, well, who's going to clean that up? Hope says to me a lot of times, you, you, you notice the garbage in the bathroom piling up. Does it ever occur to you to do it? And I'm like, well, it does, but I also know it always gets magically done. Jesus invites us not to wait for someone else or the person whose job it is. And this doesn't mean you do everything yourself. As I have learned, sometimes the way you serve is by training somebody else to do it. But that in itself can be an act of service. Do we wait around for things to magically happen? Or do we roll up our sleeves and do what no one else will do? That's what Jesus calls us to do. And the way We live out the washing of the feet of the disciples is to wash the feet of one another, to do the dirty jobs, and to take care of each other without complaint. Because that's not what Jesus would do. That's what Jesus did. And he invites us to do the same. Let's pray. Father, help us to be like Dean Smedley. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be the kind of people who go out of our way to do the thankless, dirty, menial tasks that literally no one wants to do. Because that's what Jesus modeled for us. Father, help us to be so filled with your love, so filled with your humility, so filled with your Holy Spirit, that we quickly... Move to meet the needs of others before we meet our own needs. Help us to live this way for the rest of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.